We learned last time that the Bible describes the church as a flock of sheep. Christ is our shepherd. The church is a building. Christ is our cornerstone. The church is a family. Christ is our brother, the firstborn among many, and God is our father. The church is a bride, and Christ is our bridegroom. And maybe Paul's most common illustration is that the church is a body, and Christ is the head of his body, the church. We also learned that the church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church that will endure until Christ returns, faithfully being a witness on this earth. Before we move on to the marks of the church, let's look at some other descriptive language in the Bible. Starting from Matthew 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So this language about the authority to absolve sin, this radical promise about God granting us what we agree upon in prayer in Jesus' name, and this promise that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, that's the church, there he is among them. Jesus promises his presence when his church gathers together. Matthew 28, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus sends out the church to make disciples of all nations. They do this by baptizing in God's triune name and teaching people to observe all that Christ has commanded us. And again, the promise that Jesus is with his church always to the end of the age. Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Just as under the old covenant and the tabernacle, there was that most holy place, right? Um, and the high priest under the old covenant would only enter the most holy place once a year on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. There was a thick curtain covering off that place. Well, Jesus enters into the real holy place in heaven. He does this. He makes the way through the cross. The author of Hebrews says the curtain that he opens for us is through his flesh on the cross so that we can have access to God the Father. And as sinners, we are not going to die in God's holy presence. Instead, we're going to live as forgiven sinners, Christ having cleansed us. Since we have a great priest, that's Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near, draw near to God our Father, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's a less obvious reference to baptism. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So the church is to not neglect to gather together. This is an assumption that the church gathers together regularly. And we know the church in the book of Acts did this. We see them doing it on Sundays. We'll talk about that more later. The church gathers to stir one another up towards love and good works. Love and good works is the product of faith to encourage one another all the more as the day that's the last day the day of christ's return all the more as that draws near ephesians 5 look carefully then how you walk not as wise but as unwise making the best use of the time because the days are evil therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the lord is and do not get drunk with wine maybe more literally do not be filled with wine for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we get some language about what kind of activity the church does. The church is instructed to be wise, not foolish, to make the best use of the time. The church is instructed not to be filled with wine, but filled with the Spirit. We do this as we gather around Christ's word and Christ's meal because the Holy Spirit works through these things to work in us, to sanctify us. We do this as we pray, as we fellowship together and hear the word of the Lord together. We're to sing. The church is called to sing. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. This isn't the only time we're going to see that the church is told to sing. And God doesn't tell you to do anything that isn't good for you. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
And in the following sections, Paul explains what that submission looks like in various contextual relationships, like marriage or like parents and children. Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The word of Christ is to dwell in Christ's church richly, right? It's not like we just hear the word, but we're supposed to let the word live in us, make its home in us, shape who we are, how we think, how we behave. We use the word of Christ to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. Again, we sing with one another, with thankfulness in our hearts to God. James 5, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This is like ancient medicine. You know, they didn't have pain relief pills or pills for treatment of disease or anything like that. They had oils and they used oils in a medical fashion. So is anyone sick? Let the elders know. Let's pray for him. Let's give him medicine. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The church is to also pray for those who are sick. Pray for those who confess their sins, that they might be forgiven and healed of the consequences of those sins. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working, because prayer is to our all-powerful God. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, human, just like us, frail, sinful, just like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The church is not to just let people wander off and do nothing about it. If people wander away from the true faith, often to myths, often to lies, like the good shepherd goes after the sheep, we are to try to go after our fellow brothers and sisters. Pastors are called to shepherd and do this. And know that if we bring that person back, we save their soul from death. We cover over a multitude of sins. Romans 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed, the Greek word there is hypotasso, listened under, believed. They have not all obeyed, believed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The church is Christians who gather to call on the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who saves us. Christians who gather believing in Jesus and his word, gladly hearing Jesus and his word, preaching Jesus and his word for those who are called to that office of preaching, sending out others to preach to foreign nations, foreign missionaries, because how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This good news is what creates faith. The church gladly hears the word of Christ. That's what created faith in us, and we know it can create faith in our neighbor. Ephesians 4, and he gave the apostles, that would be the 12, right, the, the sent ones, and some others like Paul, the prophets, God's mouthpieces, both Old and New Testament, whoever teaches the word of God is a prophet in this sense, the evangelists, those who teach and preach the word of God even to foreign places, the shepherds, pastors, elders, and teachers, people outside of the context of church or inside the context of church who teach the word of God, say at schools or seminaries or universities, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is a mature adult. He wants his church to be built up into maturity, adulthood. Why? So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We are not to be easily deceived by false doctrine. Being so rooted in God's word, so familiar with what it truly teaches, we identify false doctrine and we say, that's not what the Bible says. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself in love. What is the product of true faith, stubborn faith in Christ and in his word? The product is always love and good works. Speaking the truth in love, the body grows and builds itself up 
and love. 2 Timothy 4. This is one of Paul's pastoral letters. It's his second to Timothy. Paul, an older pastor, and 2 Timothy, especially an older pastor, writing to younger pastors like Timothy and Titus. And listen to what he says. I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Here we're learning the little bit of the responsibility of a pastor to preach the word in and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. These all involve correcting what is wrong, calling out what is wrong, admonishing with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound, healthy teaching, healthy if it's biblical, unhealthy if it's not biblical. But having itching ears, tell me what I want to hear. Sometimes the Bible is unpopular in what it says. It is not what people want to hear. So tell them what they want to hear. No, Paul says. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. False teachings, false gospels even. As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Timothy is to preach the true gospel, preach the word in season and out of season, whether it's popular or not. Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Under the old covenant, the Sabbath day was a day, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. It was a day of rest. It was a gift to God's people. Here, rest. I will take care of you on this day. Under the new covenant, we learn that all those things, including the Sabbath, were signs foreshadowing Christ. In this case, Christ, who is our true rest. Christ transforms the Sabbath. We don't rest one day a week in our labors. We rest every day of the week in Christ's finished labor for us. Everything necessary to reconcile a sinner like me to God my Father. Jesus has done it, and he announced on the cross it is finished. So Christians, ever since the book of Acts, ever since the first century, have not gathered together on the Sabbath to do no work in a synagogue. They have gathered together on Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day that Christ rose. They considered that the eighth day of a week because it was a new day. That day changed everything. It even changed the calendar, the years before Christ and the years A.D., Anno Domini. We're in the year of our Lord, 2023. AD 2023. So today we remember the Sabbath by remembering Christ. And we do gather together on Sundays to hear Christ's word, to receive Christ's meal, and rest in him and all he does for us. He invites us, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We rest in Christ on Sundays, the Lord's day, and every day. Acts 2. They, that would be the early church in Jerusalem, or the ancient church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, what we have recorded for us in the New Testament, to the fellowship brothers and sisters, encouraging, taking care of, fellowshipping with one another, to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. What the ancient church in Jerusalem did, the church still does all these things today. Acts 20, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Here, Paul tells the elders at Ephesus to pay careful attention to, theirself, to themselves. The pastors should take care what kind of model they are to their congregation, to their families, to all the flock. They should watch over and pay careful attention. The Holy Spirit appoints pastors to care for Christ's church, the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Acts 14, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The missionaries go back to check on those congregations to see how they're doing, strengthen them, encourage them, remind them that this world has many tribulations until the new heavens and new earth. And they appoint elders there, local pastors for those congregations. They commit those pastors to their work with prayer and fasting. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Jesus, who sanctifies us, we have one source as him, the Father, and he calls us brothers, and he sings the Father's praises in our midst. Did you know that in Matthew 26, it says before Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane, they sung a hymn before they left the Last Supper. Hebrews 13, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Who are the Christian mentors in your life who speak the word of God to you? Imitate them. 
consider their life and imitate their faith. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love because of your works. Don't complain or gripe about pastors. Respect them. Thank them.